The ancient world had been in turmoil for centuries. The old Roman Empire had been subjected to a constant flux of invasions in its mineral-rich and fertile territories to the west. Lombards, Burgundians, Huns, Vandals, Goths of all shape and form, Visigoths, Ostrogoths, Suebi, Jutes, Franks, Angles, Saxons, Picts, even the Scots all came to the conclusion at some point that they would be better served by leaving their freezing subarctic hunting grounds or arid nomadic wastelands and trying their luck pillaging that wealthy but increasingly corrupt and decadent empire to the south. In May 330, the Roman Emperor Constantine I finally decided enough was enough and transferred the capital from Rome to the Greek city of Byzantium. Not wishing to miss an opportunity to make his name go down in history, he even decided to rebaptize the ancient metropolis Constantinople, the city of Constantine, which makes up for a pitiful lack of imagination with absolutely tons of self-aggrandizement. The decision to move east was, however, not one based purely on strategic defense. Trade routes to India and China were beginning to open up, and all kinds of other activity, from finance to astronomy, were flourishing in a way that was no longer happening in the West. Byzantium had therefore become the place to be, no longer Rome. But perhaps, crucially, Constantine, along with his successors, decided the move would also be a good opportunity to napalm the increasingly fraught and overcrowded pantheon of Roman gods and make one of these new fangled monotheistic cults the religion of the state. That religion was Christianity, and yet only three centuries previously his own people had seen it fit to honor its founder Jesus Christ with crucifixion, which is not, needless to say, anybody's preferred way of dying. Things had changed a lot in those three centuries. Even before Constantine I's rule, the expansive and unwieldy Roman Empire had already grown unmanageable, and Rome's leaders had already begun experimenting in subdividing the empire into more malleable portions, such as the Emperor Diocletian's attempt at restoring some kind of military and governmental order with the introduction of the Tetrarchy, a fourfold division with a faint hint of meritocracy. But Diocletian's tetrarchy had already collapsed by the time Constantine I took power, and civil war had become the usual and bloody means of finding successors to Roman emperors. It took Constantine's charisma and leadership to briefly reunite the empire, but again, this stability was not to last. Under Theodosius I, the empire was split once more, this time in two, now known rather unimaginatively as the Western and Eastern Roman Empires. The Western Empire collapsed less than a century later, when Alaric, king of the Visigoths, besieged and sacked Rome in 410. But the Eastern Roman Empire would continue to carry the flame of Rome and even flourish. It reached its apogee in the 6th century under the Emperor Justinian I, who managed to recapture some territory lost to the barbarian invaders with the founding of the Exarchate of Ravenna, an East Roman enclave on the Italian peninsula surrounded by hostile alien kingdoms. And as Greek replaced Latin as the official language under the Emperor Heraclius, the East Roman Empire gradually became known by the original name of the city which Constantine had requisitioned to found its capital, the Byzantine Empire. Amazingly, from this point, it will take another millennium to finish the Eastern Roman Empire off for good when the city of Constantine finally falls to the Turks in 1453. But this, well, it's in the distant future. And for now, we must look at another great up-and-coming empire, the Umayyad Arab Caliphate. Although the Romans had brought sanitation, medicine, education, wine, public order, irrigation, roads, fresh water, public health, and peace to the provinces of the Byzantine Empire that lay on the Arabian Peninsula on the eastern shores of the Mediterranean, by the 6th century, a growing discontent had already reached boiling point. This may seem ungrateful on the part of the empire's colonial subjects, but the grievances of the local population of settled desert tribes were by no means unjustified. Trade routes were declining, as was Byzantine law and order, and Persia, which had been eyeing the territories to the south of its possessions in Mesopotamia for some time, had become an antagonistic force that was threatening the general stability of the region. But crucially, a shift away from the polytheism of the ancient Arab tribes to monotheistic cults such as Judaism and Christianity had brought religious strife, the like of which had never been seen across the peninsula. 
When around the year 613, in a small cave near the desert city of Mecca, a nominal Byzantine citizen received a revelation from the archangel Gabriel and started preaching a new cult soon after, a total change had occurred which would shift the balance of power in the Arabian Peninsula and eventually the Mediterranean Basin for good. While the uptake of Muhammad's religion was at first fairly lackluster, it was steady, and by 622, the Meccan religious, political, and merchant classes, fearful that their ancient but lucrative pilgrimages business was now under threat, forced the Prophet and his followers into exile in Medina, several days by camel to the north. While the Meccan merchants' fears about the threats to the ancient Arab religions were certainly founded, they could have not have been more wrong about their cherished pilgrimage. If their polytheistic gods were soon to be ignominiously napalmed in the way of their Roman counterparts, the word Mecca endures to this day as a synonym with a place of interest or attraction. The pilgrimage to Mecca, known to Muslims as the Hajj, brings in millions, if not billions of dollars to the city's coffers. After spending seven years in Medina preaching his enlightened, meritocratic, and singularly modern vision of society, the Prophet's following was such that he was able to master an army of 10,000 for the return to his hometown. He took the city with almost no resistance in 629. And with this, the first Islamic conquests had begun. And they continued when Muhammad felt a growing threat from the southern tribes and organized further military expeditions, which culminated with the Battle of Tabuk and the conquest of a considerable swath of the Arabian Peninsula. The Prophet died a few years later in 632 and was little able to profit from his victories. And while in life he managed to unite many of the local bickering tribes under the flag of a single religion, his death again brought division. When Muhammad's close friend and collaborator Abu Bakr was quickly nominated, the first caliph, with the controversy it produced, would have a lasting effect on Middle Eastern geopolitics. A breakaway group of disciples held that the Prophet's cousin and son in law, Ali ibn Abi Talib, should instead leave the nascent religious and now political movement. This would be the first of several divisions that would split the Islamic movement over the following centuries, and sectarian strife continues to this day between the followers of Ali, otherwise known as the Shia, and the followers of Abu, also known as, well, yeah, the Sunni Muslims. Yet in the early years of Islam, it would be the followers of Abu and his successors who would take center stage of Middle Eastern geopolitics. Abu became the first ruler of the so-called Rashidun Caliphate, which the followers of Ali, the Shia, immediately declared illegitimate. The fact that Rashidun means rightfully guided in Arabic held little sway, and the Shia, not letting themselves be guided by Sunni propaganda, were having absolutely none of it. A schism that was never again to close had just opened up. But perhaps the most remarkable thing about the Rashidun Caliphate's brief 25-year history were the considerable military successes of its five rulers against not just the Byzantine Empire, but also the Persians. The Battle of Yarmouk, which took place in the summer of 636 on the eponymous river that is close to the current Syrian-Jordanian border, was a major rout of the vastly superior Byzantine forces. The Arab victory would establish the reputation of the second Rashidun Caliph Umar's commander, Khalid ibn al-Walid, as one of the greatest military strategists of all time. And a little over a year later, the Arab troops took Jerusalem. Among those entering the Holy City was a little-known scribe who had started rising through the military ranks of the Rashidun army. That scribe was called Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan, and he was soon to become its future provincial governor. Later, he would go on to even greater things, becoming the first caliph of the Umayyad Caliphate, the Rashidun Caliph's immediate successor. But for now, we're jumping the gun, and we'll return to the story of the Umayyad Caliphate and Muawiyah, the Khosro of the Arabs, a little bit later on. During the reign of its first two rulers, Abu and Umar, the Rashidun Caliphate would morph into a veritable empire snatched from the prized Byzantine possessions of Syria, Palestine, and the Egyptian Exarchate. And soon, the Sasanian Empire in Persia would succumb to the forces of the third Caliph, Uthman, who, with over 100,000 men under his command, swashbuckled the Rashidun Caliphate to its greatest extent. Although the Persians were able to charge at Uthman's armies with such exotic and terrifying things as war elephants, the agile and lightly armored Arab horsemen were easily able to outmaneuver a Persian cavalry, more used to fighting tight geometrical formations of Roman legionaries who rarely throw away the book 
when it came to military tactics. In the Battle of Walaya in 633, the celebrated Arab commander Khalid ibn al-Walid had already excelled himself even before his famous victory at Yarmouk by routing the vastly numerically superior Persian forces in Mesopotamia with an early example of a newfangled military maneuver now known as a pincer movement. With the conquest of Sasanian Persia, Usman's Rashidun Empire now spanned from what is present-day Tunisia all the way east to the current borders of Pakistan. And this was only in 654, barely 22 years after the Prophet's death. Although the astonishing military successes of the Rashidun Caliphs were certainly a sign of the strength of the Arab armies, they were nevertheless a telling indicator of the weakness not only of the Byzantine Empire, but also of the Persian Sasanians. Both sides had been left floundering following the long byzantine sasanian War of Attrition between the years 602 and 628. While the Persian and Byzantine armies battled over Jerusalem, resulting in its brief capture by the Sasanians in 613, Eurasian nomads known as Avars, along with various aligned Slavonic tribes, saw an opportunity not to be missed and poured into the Balkans, capturing several key Byzantine cities, including Singadunum, today Belgrade, Viminasium, contemporary Kostolats, Nisus, or Nish, and finishing with Sedika, today Sophia in 614. Eventually, all three sides, Avars, Slavs, and Persians, ganged up against Byzantium and its emperor Heraclius and besieged Constantinople in 626. As the Avars and Slavs poured in from the European side towards Constantinople, the Persian Sasanians took up position on the eastern banks of the Bosphorus that overlooked the Byzantine capital just beyond its western shores. Although the Persians were experts in siege warfare, communication between the motley axis of besiegers was constantly thwarted by the Byzantine rather annoying habit of sinking anything that tried to cross that famous narrow strait between Europe and Asia Minor. After a number of catastrophic naval defeats and unable to benefit from Persian military know-how, the Avars and Slavs eventually called off the siege, forcing the Persians to follow suit. Meanwhile, the Khazars, later to be known as the Turks, also took an opportunity not to be missed and started taking swaths of the Sasanian hinterlands that bordered the Caspian Sea. This would turn out to be a very ominous turn of events. They would, however, take the costly Battle of Nineveh in 627 to draw the war to a close, leaving both the main belligerent parties licking their wounds for years to come. The third Rashidun Caliph, Uthman, took the throne in 644, and escaping accusations of nepotism, made the little-known general and fellow member of his Umayyad tribe, Muawiyah ibn Abun Sufyan, the governor of Syria. During his governorship, Muawiyah created strategic alliances with local tribes and started building up the fortifications of the coastal towns, which would be the first line of defense should the hurt pride of the conquered Byzantine emperor Heraclius finally get the better of him, and he might decide that he wanted his cherished Syria back at any cost. When Uthman was assassinated in 656, Muawiyah resolved to avenge the death of his fellow tribesmen. But perhaps crucially for the history of the next two millennia, he, Muhammad's widow Aisha, and several of Muhammad's old disciples joined the faction opposing the election of the Prophet's cousin Ali as Uthman's successor. This marked the beginning of the first fitna, a civil war which after many swings eventually ended in Muawiyah's favor. When negotiations failed between Ali and Muawiyah's factions, the Matter was swiftly settled, ostensibly at least, in the Battle of the Camel in 656, so named because the fighting was called off when the Camel of the Prophet's widow, Asia, was very symbolically and ominously killed. Ali was the victor and became caliph, whereupon he dismissed Muawiyah and many of Uthman's other appointees. Muawiyah, obviously not pleased about this at all, declared war on Ali, and soon thereafter the factions battled it out in the Battle of Sifin. But it would take a victory against an early and violent violent extremist Islamic cell, the Qajites, in the Battle of Narawan for Ali to finally consolidate his power. Yet this was not to last for long. Ali too was assassinated a few years later in 661, and Muawiyah swiftly took the opportunity to fill the gaping power vacuum left in the Prophet's cousin's wake. He was able to buy off the army of Ali's eldest son Hassan and assume the throne. The Umayyad Caliphate had begun, named after the tribe from which Muawiyah and its subsequent leaders came. Muawiyah's authoritarian rule, which occasionally gave off unpleasant whiffs of corruption, soon led his contemporaries to compare him with the infamous Persian despot Khosrow, the Khosrow of the Arabs. 
But his reputed tyrannical grip and the in-depth knowledge of Byzantine tactics he acquired as one of Uthman's commanders would only accelerate the military successes of the Arabs. He led land assaults in Africa and launched a naval campaign which rapidly culminated in seizure of the strategic island of Cyprus from the Byzantine Empire. Cyprus would later turn out to be an essential staging post for the final assault on Constantinople itself. Yet contrary to his reputation and almost in an enlightened Napoleonic style, the reign of Mawia was marked by the reform and restructuring of the caliphate's already Byzantine administration. He created broad government departments known as Diawans and even set up a postal route. In many ways, Mawia's government had hints of modernity which did not exist in Western Europe that was already well and truly submerged in the Dark Ages. Meanwhile, Ali's disgruntled supporters felt very much left out in the cold and were not really happy about this state of affairs. They continued to battle for years to come against Muawiyah's Umayyads and their successors, the Abbasid dynasty. They finally get their comeuppance by founding the Idrisian, Fatimid, and Alid dynasties a few centuries later. But this is another story which is still being told to the Middle East and elsewhere to this very day and just out of the scope of today's already very busy video. Perhaps one of Muawiyah's historically most important achievements, if not his greatest achievement, is his transformation of the Arab navy into a modern and ferocious fighting force. From the very beginning of his reign, Muawiyah had been eyeing with some glee the massive gain of wealth and power that he could achieve by conquering a Byzantine empire weakened by years of fending off barbarians and bickering with its neighbors. As a naval commander under Uthman, Muawiyah had already excelled himself by successfully capturing the Byzantine island stronghold of Cyprus in 649, and he consolidated this victory a few years later in 654 by leading Uthman's growing Arab navy to victory in the Battle of the Masts, which took place off the Lycian coast in what's today Turkey. Indeed, the dreams of the then Byzantine Emperor Constans the night before the battle certainly did not bode well. For some reason, he dreamt that he was in Thessalonica, and in his troubled sleep, everything to do with that city became a recurring theme. And when he recounted the dream to his Soothsayer, the 7th century equivalent of a modern day psychoanalyst, the soothsayer unhelpfully observed that Thessaloniki sounded something like the Greek word Thessaloniki, which means other will take victory. In a brewing storm, and with their triremes lashed together with grappling hooks to allow for hand to hand combat, while their ship's masts locked overhead, both sides suffered extremely heavy losses, not only to the savage fighting, but also to the pounding seas. Yet, the ultimate Arab success was not not by any means a Pyrrhic victory. It would have a lasting effect on the balance of power in the Mediterranean. In particular, it meant from then onwards the sea would no longer be a Roman pond that required simple patrolling on the part of the Byzantine navy to ward off pirate attacks. They would now require defense by means of a strategic fleet of state-of-the-art warships, something the Byzantines found increasingly difficult to afford with their catastrophic losses of their immensely wealthy territories in Egypt and Syria. To the Arab Empire. It also meant that the prized Byzantine capital Constantinople was now tantalizingly within Muawiyah's grasp. In the early years of the Umayyad Caliphate, Muawiyah further consolidated the successes of Cyprus and the Battle of the Mars with raids on the islands of Kos, Rhodes, and Crete in the Aegean Sea. And under the command of Adala ibn Abayyad, another of the Prophet Muhammad's old disciples, Muawiyah's forces were able to gradually edge their way up the Anatolian coast towards Constantinople itself. Crucially, the Arab soldiers began wintering on enemy territory, and in doing so found as many ways as possible to sabotage Byzantine power and disrupt disrupt the local economy. In particular, they destroyed swaths of farmlands in what was essentially a scorched earth policy. And the bad dreams of the Emperor Constans would continue in 668, when the Byzantine governor of the region, Saborius, sought Muawiyah's aid in staging a coup against the empire. Far away on a campaign in Sicily, Constans eventually got wind of this and sent an envoy, the eunuch Andrew, to the Arab Caliph to try and buy him off. But it was too late. Saborius had already offered the entire public revenue of the empire to Muawiyah, who naturally found the offer too good to refuse, and Andrew found himself in an impossible position. He would have exceeded his authority, to say the least, if he offered more than the empire could give. Now, with the massive Arab armies and navy behind him, as well as his own considerable force of rebels recruited from the Byzantine military, Saborius was ready to strike. The Constans, this was not just a bad dream, 
but his worst nightmare. Fortunately for the recurrent insomnia of the Byzantine emperor, a hapless Saborius killed himself by falling off his horse and slamming his head into the gates of a newly conquered city. Now leaderless, the rebellion was quickly called off. But the tide had already turned, and over the following months, Constans would rarely have his full eight hours worth. Moarian and his commander for Dala had reached Chalcedon by the spring of 669. Back then, Chalcedon was a separate town on the eastern banks of the Bosphorus, but today it's a run-of-the-mill suburb of Istanbul, the modern name of Constantinople. Marwia was almost literally on Constans's doorstep. The attack on Chalcedon was eventually repelled after the Arab forces succumbed to famine and disease, mainly due to their own destruction of farmlands and trade as a result of Muawiyah's scorched earth policy. But for Muawiyah, this was just a setback, and he continued to consolidate his strongholds on the Anatolian coast and dream of conquest. Meanwhile, Constance still needed sleep, and now he saw the only means of getting it would be making his forces invincible. Now faced with almost overwhelming military opposition, he needed something more than simple brute force. He needed a secret weapon. Whether it was an already established weapon, for according to some sources, the Romans had already been using some kind of self-lighting incendiary substance since the 5th century, or whether it was a completely new invention, is a subject of heated debate among historians of late antiquity. But few of them can deny that the arrival of the brainchild of a certain Syrian refugee from Heliopolis, an architect and chemist going by the name of Kalinikos, had a profound effect on the insomniac emperor's arsenal. While still living in Syria, Kalinikos had already developed a new kind of explosive incendiary liquid that proved to be extremely effective in battles against Arab warships. Scant information survives to this day on him and his invention. One of the best accounts is given by the 8th century monk Theophanes, who described Kalinikos as an artificer from Heliopolis who fled to the Romans. He had devised a sea fire which ignited the Arab ships and burned them with all hands on board. Thus it was that the Romans returned with victory and discovered the sea far. Although the exact recipe of what Theophanes described as sea far was a closely guarded secret known only to the Byzantine navy, we can still gather some idea of the makeup of this effective and devastating naval weapon. It almost certainly contained resin, asphalt, sulfur, naphtha, fine quicklime, calcium phosphide, even saltpeter, in carefully proportioned doses. Some sources describe it as a liquid with the capacity to ignite on contact with water. Others suggest that direct sunlight was enough to do the job and that it exploded with thunder. And while from these descriptions, this substance invented by Callicus was certainly formidable in itself, a formidable weapon is unfortunately worthless if it can't be delivered effectively to the enemy. This is where Callicus's genius as an engineer came in. His Greek fire was not simply the recipe for an explosively inflammable liquid. It was a complete armament delivery system. As conceived by him, the whole Greek fire weapon system almost certainly involved preheating this combustible liquid in some kind of high-pressure boiler, which would have been an extraordinary technical achievement without the use of modern welding techniques. By means of a complex system of valves and pumps, the high-pressure liquid is then projected over a distance of around 15 meters, directed by a large brass nozzle surrounded by iron shielding to protect the operator from the intense heat. A pilot flame in the form of lit oil-soaked rag ignites Ignites this jet of napalm of late antiquity, making the whole thing essentially a giant shipboard flamethrower. We can imagine at this point that even Elon Musk would be impressed. With a change of soothsayer, with the supposedly decisive defeat of the Muslim armies at Chalcedon behind him, and now with his new secret, deadly, devastating, and generally invincible weapon, the sleep of the Byzantine Emperor Constans had found again the healthy and regular pattern of his carefree youth. But this was not a last. Although he knew nothing of the Byzantines' new secret weapon, Amoaria, emboldened by the initial success of the attack on Chalcedon, decided by 674 that he could not wait any longer for his prized conquest. With the navy bolstered by the output of the immense shipyards of a newly conquered Alexandria, the day was just gasping to be seized. In the spring of that year, he ordered his admiral Abdallah ibn Qiz to join the command of Fadala and set sail for the Sea of Marmara, a strategically important but modest expanse of water that bleeds from the Mediterranean to the Bosphorus and onto the Byzantine capital. Not lacking audacity, they landed in Hebdomen, a town which, like Chalcedon, is another present-day suburb of Istanbul, but this time Time, it was on the western side rather than the eastern shores of the Bosporus. The engagement 
had begun. While the Byzantines were able to hide behind the immense city walls, which had been almost constantly expanded and reinforced since Roman times, all supplies to and from the city were subject to constant harassment by the Arabs throughout that very long summer. Skirmishes were daily, mainly around the main entrances to the city, the Golden Gate and the Kyclobian, and they lasted from dawn until after dusk. However, when autumn came, and with no final resolution of the conflict, the Arabs disappeared. But instead of taking the road to Damascus, the Umayyad Caliphate's then capital, they dug in around the nearby town of Cyzicus, or even according to some sources, on one of the small islands in the Sea of Marmara. Predictably, the next spring they returned, and the harassment continued until the Arabs withdrew again for the winter the conflict still unresolved. And this pattern repeated itself the following year and the year after that. The Arabs harassed while the Byzantines struggled to keep their supply lines into the city open. A parallel can certainly be drawn to the siege of Leningrad during the Second World War. In both cases, the winter months allowed the two besieged cities to replenish their reserves. Following the ominous assassination of Constance in his bath, his replacement Constantine IV finally decided enough was enough. Seeing the immense size and modernity of the Arab fleet, he knew that his only chance of breaking this deadlock would be with the deployment of a top-secret weapon. It was time to use the Greek fire, and he gave the order. Incinerating the Arab ships one by one with their new devastating wonder weapon, the Byzantines quickly routed the Arab fleet in the immense battle that ensued. It even resulted in the death of Muaria's admiral Yazid ibn Shigara. Meanwhile, Constantine IV sent his armies led by generals Folorus, Petron, and Cyprian to strike, inflicting a catastrophic defeat of the Muslim armies in Asia Minor, beyond the eastern shores of the Bosphorus. According to the chronicle Monk Theophanes, Muawiyah's commander Sufyan ibn Auf may have lost upwards of 30,000 men in the fighting. These two resounding defeats in quick succession left a chagrined Muawiyah with no choice. He ordered his forces to withdraw and the siege was called off. This was 668, four years after the beginning of the campaign. And to add insult to injury, much of the crippled land and heavily singed retreating Arab fleet was sunk in a storm. Even though the first Arab siege of Constantinople ultimately ended in failure for Muawiyah's Umayyad Caliphate, it nevertheless marked a sea change in the global perception of the regional balance of power. News of the immense siege may even have reached as far as China as the Chinese dynastic histories contain a reference to the well-fortified capital of Fu Lin, their word for Byzantium, which had been besieged by the Da Shi, the Umayyad Arabs, and their commander, Mo Yi, probably an approximate transliteration of Moawia. An embattled Constantinople would go on to endure many more sieges over the centuries to come, including another unsuccessful Arab siege, the Second Arab Siege of Constantinople in 717, which ended even more disastrously than the first. Over the winter of 717 and 718, there were reports that some of the starving Arab soldiers had resorted to cannibalism to survive the unusually harsh conditions of that season. Even though a progressively weakened Constantinople ended up being briefly occupied by the Crusaders in the early 13th century, it would take nearly a millennium for the city to fall to Muslim forces for good. This happened when, under the leadership of their Sultan Mehmed II, the Ottoman Turks took the last remnants of the Byzantine Empire in 1453. Yet in the 7th century, the first Arab siege of Constantinople was, by any standard, an extremely close call. If Mao's dream of conquering Byzantium and its empire had come true, the course of history might have been very different. Should Constantinople have fallen back then instead of in 1453, Eastern Orthodox Christianity would have been almost completely extinguished. And it certainly would not have spread to the Rus, the Slavonic tribes with Norse heritage who then occupied much of the territory of present-day European Russia. So I really hope you found this video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to subscribe and thank you for watching.